right, so if you open up It's Learning, you will find uh, a quiz on there that's just been opened up, and it's over sedimentary rocks. You'll have to dig into the resources tab right now because I haven't put it on the front of the page yet. Uh, but hop on there, open that up. It's going to go right along with what we're talking about here. Making sure I can find it here. Okay, first question is about the four types of sedimentary rocks. So let's delve into the depths of sedimentary rocks. Uh, this is a picture of my lovely wife here. This is in the Badlands out on an Indian reservation. Uh, has anybody been to the Badlands in South Dakota before? Have you? It's amazing, isn't it? It is really, it's one of the most starkly contrasted landscapes. You're driving across all these flat plains, and then all of a sudden, canyon lands just open up before your eyes, and it's just crazy looking. The weathering and erosion that's taken place in these sedimentary rocks, it's just so cool um, how it's all eroded. And you can see clearly the layers, the lines in it, the layers of rock here, because sedimentary rocks form by settling, like layer after layer settles in an ancient ocean. This is all sandstone here that you see uh, before my wife here. And off the edge of that where she's standing is like, I don't know, two, 300 feet down. It's, it's a long, long way down. And sedimentary rocks are of particular interest to us because they're what contain most of the fossils. Uh, think about the other rock types, squishing, cooking, melting, not much chance of a fossil surviving those. This is actually a fossil I found on this hike we were on. Uh, that's a fossil turtle shell. Isn't that crazy? It was about this big. About like, a, nah, what is that? A little bigger than a cantaloupe-ish size. Uh, pretty big. Um, but yeah, the fossilized turtles are pretty rare, honestly. Uh, but there are a number of them out there in the Dakotas. Um, so that's pretty cool. All right, let's look again at the whole of the rock cycle. Some of the rocks we're going to be looking at here. Uh, we're concentrating in the bottom right-hand corner over here where it shows us the different types of sedimentary rocks. So there's some structures down below here. Uh, some of the rock types we're going to look at, the clastic ones, the chemical ones. Uh, we're going to break these down, but this is the whole big blow up. Remember the cycle of rocks. Any rock can turn into any other rock. So a sedimentary rock can become an igneous rock if it melts. An igneous rock could get ground up into bits and become a sedimentary rock, right? Every one of them can become each other. It just depends on what happens to them. So sedimentary rocks are super useful because they, they're almost like a layer of history on our planet. Uh, the entire surface of our planet, even the oceans, is covered by a thin layer of, of sediment ground up stuff that's on the surface, whether it's decomposed things or little bits of rock that have ground up. But this, this material and that of it that's turned to rock is covering over a basement of igneous and metamorphic rocks. So the oldest rock on our planet is mostly metamorphic and igneous rock. It's way, way down at the bottom. So if you think about digging, even here in Indiana, which is almost entirely sedimentary rock, if you dug, say we started digging a hole in Columbus, First of all, you dig through a whole bunch of river deposits and ancient glacial deposits, ground up gravel and stuff. And if you've ever dug a hole at your house, you know, you get through the sod and then all of a sudden it's like gravelly and sandy and like you just keep digging. If you live around here, I guarantee that's what you see. You, you would eventually hit water, but if you kept going and digging and digging, you would hit bedrock. And the bedrock that you would hit would most likely be sandstones and limestones, sedimentary layers that are in sheets. If you kept drilling through the rock, hundreds of feet down, eventually you would get to the basement rock, uh, which would be some form of igneous or metamorphic rock, almost guaranteed, no matter where you are in the world. So in places like the Grand Canyon, you can start walking from the top, and it's layer upon layer of ancient ocean, sand dunes, like layer upon layer, all the way down till you get to the bottom, and you hit the Vishnu Schist, which is a metamorphic rock. So it's been down there, it's been heated, it's been cooked, it's been mushed. It's ancient, ancient. It's billions of years old. So that's the basement. Um, and uh, we, can, we can see that in various parts of the earth, especially in the canyon, right? The first group we're going to talk about of sedimentary rocks is called the clastic rocks. I think that's part of the question here. What are the four types of sedimentary rocks and how are they made? The first group 
is the clastic sedimentary rocks. This is the traditional, like when you think of sedimentary rock, this is loose material that gets compressed, compacted, uh, and then cemented together. Okay, and th these are the steps in forming this. So if you want to jot some of these down, okay. The whole process is known as lith lithification. <laughs> Lithics is, is stone. So lith lithification is turning loose stuff into solid rock. So how does that happen? Well, move this microphone here. That happens, first of all, the stuff's got to get buried. Okay? It's got to end up deep somewhere because it's got to get compacted. So if you're thinking about the material that's out here in front of the school, uh, whatever's out there underneath the grass is not going to turn to rock. We could wait a million years, it's not going to turn into rock. First of all, it's not very deep enough. It has to get compacted in the poor spaces between it. As you see in this picture here, they get crushed closer and closer together. It's got to get pretty tight. Secondly, uh, it's got to be cemented. And the way these things get cemented is by uh, forming in, in locations like underneath the ocean or underneath a lake where water can percolate through all those pores that are in this, the loose stuff that's been compacted and then start to deposit uh, cements. So there's lots of things that can cement. Anything that can end up in solution can become a cement and glue it together. So compacting uh, and compressing and then cementing. There we have it. Lithification. Classic sedimentary rocks. Easy to remember because it's made up of broken up bits of stuff. Everybody have that one? Okay. Um, the next class is the biochemical ones. I got, I've got them all listed on here, so if you missed the last one, you can jot it down. Uh, the biochemical ones are cemented bits of shells and other organisms. And you can see that really uh, clearly here. See all these cemented shells together. Some of you guys found those. Notice the brachiopods there. Found those in the creek. Um, so that's a biochemical one. Over there on the left is sandstone, and it's hard to see the individual little pieces, which are called clasts. There are little bits of sand in here all cemented together. The, the glue, the cement that's holding them together, it could be silica, it could be iron. There's definitely some iron in there, it's red. It could be um, calcite, it might fizz if you put acid on it. So we'll test those things. Uh, the next group is the organics. So these are organic sedimentary rocks. And these things form because things like coal are a rock. So coal is the buried plant remains of ancient trees that fell into swamps, got buried, um, and eventually turned to rock that we call coal. It's pretty soft stuff for the most part, right? Bituminous coal is pretty soft. So uh, those are the organic uh, sedimentary rocks. So really similar to the biochemical ones. Like for all intents and purposes, we might just lump them together and say the ones that came from living creatures cemented together. Uh, then the chemical ones. These are the weird ones that are going to be hard to tell. So some of these sedimentary rocks are going to be super easy because you're going to go, what size of chunk is, makes it up? And you can identify the rock. The other ones are going to be weird because the chemical ones are essentially just the cement. That's one way to think of it. So what if there's no material cemented together? It's just the, the glue. Um, the chemical ones could be all iron. Do you remember the iron concretions you found in the creek? That's just all iron cement, essentially. They could be all... All silica, remember the chert you found? That's all cryptocrystalline, uh, basically quartz, all cemented together. Okay? Uh, but that stuff could have cemented a bunch of fossils together, too. Okay? And sometimes you find those in the chert. All right, everybody have the first question answered? Does anybody need another second here? Everybody got it? Let me know if you're still typing. I'll, I'll wait. All right, I'm going to move on here. Okay. Uh, we classify sedimentary rocks based on, number one, how big are the chunks, the class that are in them, okay? uh, how angular and spherical the class are. Are they sharp and pointy or are they rounded, which tells us something. Um, how well sorted they are. Uh, and then what, what's gluing them together? That's pretty much what we look at. Because you can have just about anything inside of a sedimentary rock. It's just ground up bits of stuff. Okay, so you can get all kinds of different ones. Um, this is not a super well sorted one here. There's all sorts of different sizes in here. 
But because it's got some of these larger ones, we would probably call it a conglomerate because they're rounded. See how they're rounded little pebbles in there? Now, we can find out a lot about a sedimentary rock by looking at those clasts. How rounded are they? And this will tell us how far it was transported. So think about a rock that's on the side of a cliff. It breaks off, it falls down, it crashes, it bashes, it cracks. It's sharp and pointy, right? If it, if it gets buried right there at the base of the cliff and gets lithified into a rock, it's gonna be a rock that contains lots of sharp and pointy little rocks inside of the bigger rock. So we know it didn't get transported very far. However, if the stuff that breaks off rolls into a creek and washes in, in down to a creek and the creek grinds it up and runs it down the creek and then runs it into a river and it runs down the river and eventually it gets spit out onto a beach and gets buried and gets compacted and lithifies. Now we've got some material that not only is it smaller grains, but they're very well rounded because they got transported farther from the source. So you can answer that next question if you just look at that picture right there. The further something is transported, the more well-rounded it is. Right? The further it's transported, the more well-rounded it is. Okay. The, the more rounded it will be, the further it's transported. Here's another picture of something pretty similar. Okay. Really well-sorted material, if it's well-sorted, um, it's going to look kind of like this. If it's poorly sorted, it might look like this. Was this the question that I had? I was thinking about rounding, but maybe it was about sorting. So also, as well as how rounded it is, the further it's transported, the better the sorting. Okay. So think about the creek. When the creek's making a sandbar and it's flowing, right? if it's flowing really fast, it will deposit the biggest pebbles. So the big sandbar with all the big rocks on it, the only way the creek could put new rocks up there is if it's really moving. So it gets higher, it really flows fast, and it picks up those bigger pebbles and cobbles and drops them there. As it slows down, the water level drops too. It's slowing down. It can't even reach the top of that sandbar anymore. It slows down now to the point where it's going slow enough that it's depositing lots and lots of sand, like on the edge of that sandbar that we first come to when we walk out there. If it keeps slowing down, which it probably would, uh, it'll start to, de to deposit layer after layer of silty, clay, sort of really fine stuff. And you can feel that, like right as you walk off the beach, it goes from like gravel to nice sand to more mucky stuff, right? And that's just because of the speed of the water going. Everybody get that one answered? Uh, trying to preview this with me. Okay, can't answer that next one yet. We haven't got there. So the cements that we might see, and these are some of them that we'll look for down in lab, we can have a quartz-rich cement, like in the case of chert, or even geodes. Geodes are made of this stuff. So that's dissolved in the water. It's not solid. Don't think of it that way. Calcite, which is common around here, because this comes from all of the limestone, and most of the rocks and minerals that form inside caves are essentially just calcite gluing stuff together. Uh, hematite, which is, do you remember what hematite was down lab? We just did that one. What color was hematite? What street color? It was the dark blackish looking mineral, but it had a streak that was not green. Hematite, like uh, think about your blood. Red, yep, had the red streak. So this is the rust red color you see in the sandstone over here. This is sand glued together with hematite. Basically iron cement is what it is. Uh, clay minerals. So clays can, can glue things together. We'll see that in the case with shale. So here are some classic sedimentary rocks and how we classify them. Basically, you say to yourself, is the material making up coarse? Is it pebble size? Is it sand size? Is it the size of silt? Or is it the size of clay? And then you've got your rock. It's really that easy. So in the case of the question on the online there, uh, if we're looking at something for instance, it's made up of coarse, like pebble-sized material, two millimeters or more, maybe. We call it a conglomerate. And some of you guys found those. They're hard to find down on the creek. They're pretty rare. Okay, you found a conglomerate if the pebbles are rounded. If the pebbles that make it up are sharp and pointy, we call it a brescia. Okay. Sandstone is, well, sand-sized stuff glued together. But remember, sand comes in like that really fine, powdery sand that's like super, super soft. 
all the way up to stuff that's quite a bit coarser, like maybe even two millimeters or, or so. Like you can have pretty big chunky sand too. So at some point we just stop calling it sand and start calling it a conglomerate, right? So it's kind of a gradation here. Siltstone is made up of really fine silty stuff. Now the difference between silt and, and clay, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's another one of those you have to have a cutoff someplace. But the easy thing to do is if you grab the rock and it's obviously not sand, but it feels kind of gritty, that grit is the silt. Silt actually feels gritty. One test for silt is to put a little bit in your mouth and rub it on your teeth and it feels gritty, then you've got silt. If it feels slippery, you've got clay. I know that's great, isn't it? Like geologists have something seriously loose up there. They're a little messed up. Uh, clay though would give us a shale. So once it, when it compresses, it makes those flat sheets. So that's another way to tell too, do you have something that's really flat and sheet like, like that? You guys, everybody in here found a piece of shale. Guaranteed, you all found shale. And most of you found sandstone. And a very few of you found some conglomerates. Siltstone tends to just get destroyed and there's not a ton of it down there. <clears throat> okay, everybody answered that one? Rounded coarse grains. So let's look at those biochemical ones and those organic ones. So the biochemical ones, there's some hard mineral skeletons like shells actually pressed together and, and hardened up like this limestone here. Uh, it's basically calcium carbonate, but there's all these shells all stuck in there that are cemented together. Organic stuff uh, is typically the remains of, we're talking about coal here. It's the remains of, of, of dead trees that have fallen millions, hundreds of millions of years ago and then turned into coal deposits. Uh, biochemical limestone is just limestone that's got a whole bunch of shell fragments in it. Uh, it usually forms in warm tropical waters. So when we see all the limestone out here uh, in Indiana, we know this had to be a shallow ocean. That's where you get limestone. And then we start to find corals and all of those things. Uh, and there's lots of different types of limestone. Uh, the stuff that's really fine, we call it uh, micritic limestone, micrite. Uh, there's lots of different words to describe the types of limestone. And part of that is because it's such a good building material. Like all of um, basically Washington DC is built from Indiana rocks. We shipped all of our rocks from Bedford over to Washington, D.C., and an awful lot of the monuments and all that stuff, it's all limestone, is built from our rock, which is kind of neat. So where does this biochemical stuff come from? And this is the answer to the next question on your quiz. Uh, chert is, is made of a type of quartz known as cryptocrystalline quartz. So it doesn't form big crystally looking things. Um, it's more opaline. It's more... Uh, uh, it, 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 it breaks in these nice conchoidal fractures, um, it, but it doesn't look like big crystals, okay, as, as it would inside of a geode. So where does this type of silica come from that makes chert? So we're talking about like basically liquid quartz here, SiO2. So how do you get that? Well, it turns out there's some critters known as diatoms and radiolarians that are all over the place in shallow oceans. And what happens is when they die, their skeletons, among other things, are made up of silica, SiO2. So these things, along with some sponges and things like that, die and settle to the bottom of the ocean. So if you've got, say, a layer of limestone that's been formed underneath the ocean, and then later on, a deposit of these things happens, as they become rock, as the material around them and on top of them becomes rock, their little skeletons, uh, the silica dissolves out of them and then what happens is it will fill in voids in the other rock. So if there was a, say there was a shell fossil inside of this limestone, the shell might get totally dissolved away and it might be completely replaced with silica from the, from the skeletons of these tiny, these are little, um, radiolarians and diatoms are microscopic. They're really small. Okay, you see them in ocean water. They're super, super common even today. So that's typically where all that chert comes from that you guys find, there's so much of it. Why is there so much? Well, it's hard, it scratches glass. Whereas limestone just wears away over time, the chert is resistant to chemicals, is resistant to tumbling in the creek. So every orange rock you pick up, every gray rock you pick up is almost always chert down in the creek. Right? Did everybody get that one? Where the opaline silica comes from? Right. 
Now the coal bearing um, seams that we see uh, come from the altered remains of ancient fossil vegetation. Like it's literally fossils. And there's sometimes you can break open a piece of coal and you'll find a little fern leaf in there. You'll find like plant parts inside the coal. It's, it's super common. Uh, but to make coal, it's not just any old environment. You have to have a burial happen someplace, for instance, where there's not a lot of oxygen, like in a swamp. It has to get buried in a certain location. So any old tree that dies, it's not going to make coal. And most of the trees that made coal are a species of uh, like li lipidodendron, which is like a, an ancient fossil tree that doesn't exist anymore. So this, the thing that made them doesn't even made coal isn't even around anymore. So that's why we say coal is a non-renewable resource. We've only got so much. Um, even if more is being formed today, we're talking hundreds of millions of years to make it. And nobody's got time to wait around for that if we want to run a steam engine or something. So we better find other forms of energy, right? Uh, shale can also contain oil. Uh, it's been basically heated up organic matter in the, the oil. I've got some oil, oil shale downstairs I'll show you. It's, it's almost kind of like wet in a way, like when it comes out of the ground. So when they're pumping oil out of the ground, when they're drilling, they're not necessarily hitting a big pocket of, of liquid. Sometimes they're drilling into some shale rock like you picked up in the creek, and there's so much oil soaked up in there that they can slurp it out or they'll frack it. They'll, they'll crack it by pumping water down into it to crack it all up, and then they can pull more of it out with the water and then kind of clean it up. It's a gross process. The fracking's not great because it cracks the other rock, and then where does all that, that oil leak? Well, into the groundwater. So places where they do fracking oftentimes have very contaminated groundwater. That's why there's a lot of environmentalists that are way against fracking. Um, but it does allow us to get some more oil out when we want it. Here's some biogenic sedimentary rocks. So there's some coal. I just lumped them together. Uh, coquina is a, a type of limestone that's really loose. It's just shells. It, if you go down to Florida, you will find tons of this stuff. It's like the most common rock in Florida. Have anybody seen this stuff in Florida before? Looks like maybe somebody made it. it it's almost like barely cement. You could just break pieces off of it, just crumble it apart. Their roads are made out of a lot of this stuff. If you look closely at a road in Florida or a sidewalk, you'll see little shell bits and stuff in there because it's the most common rock. Some whole houses sometimes are built out of like bricks of this stuff. It's not super sturdy though, um, but it'll be like on the outside for decoration. Uh, coal, we do mine bituminous coal around here. It's the dirty coal. It's the sedimentary rock style coal. A couple other sedimentary type rocks. Something known as travertine, which we talked about already when I showed you those speleothemes. Uh, this is the, the technical name for the rock that makes up the formations in the, in the caves. Okay. Can also form on the surface of hot springs, but it's full of calcium carbonate. This stuff would fizz like crazy. It's basically calcite. Right? Um, so this happens because uh, of the calcium uh, that's dissolved in the rock, out of the rock, and then it mixes as it goes through. Uh, it, it comes into contact with the air and the surface of the cave wall, and then it precipitates and you end up with these cool formations. We already talked about that stuff. All right, here's a weird thing that happens, and I wanted to mention it because you see it down in the creek and you're, you've identified it for your rock collections. Um, limestone can turn dolomitic. So dolomite is actually a mineral. It's, it's a pretty looking mineral. It has a crystal shape and everything, but limestone can become what's known as dolostone or dolomitic limestone. As it gets really old, uh, it gets altered so that some of the calcium gets replaced by magnesium. And that has kind of two effects on it. One, it turns kind of this buffy color, and you can see the top layer here is buff, and the layer beneath it um, is more the, the, the traditional gray limestone color. Okay, so this, this, is, this limestone has turned dolomitic. It's now dolomitic limestone. And then you see the picture on the right is some dolo, dolo stone, some dolomitic limestone. Um, it's, it tends to be a little bit more porous, so water can move through it better, um, and it tends to look sort of this color. Now, what's, what real effect is there? Well, it will no longer fizz when you put acid on it. You've got to scratch it and powder it, and then it fizzes really well. And that's why we were digging at it with the nail, and it's just because some of it's been replaced, replaced with magnesium. Now, the truth is, nobody really knows exactly how this happens. <laughs> it's kind of a little bit of a geological mystery. Um, we just know that it does happen. We just, nobody really knows exactly how the process takes place. 
And it's something that's kind of currently being studied. Um, there are some different ideas, but nobody knows for sure. Everybody answer that question? Everybody got it? OK. So uh, let's look at some of the other chemical uh, sedimentary rocks. Like I said, the chemical ones, we don't look for the size of the class. There's no class. So there's no pieces. They just look weird, like geodes. They're all funny looking. Think of a fossil that got replaced and grew and deformed. That's what a geode is basically. That's what it is around here. Iron concretions, sometimes they look like little cups. It's like concentric ring after ring of, of iron hematite that's been deposited. And so when you rub it on something, it like rubs that bright reddish orange rust color. Uh, limestone, which can come in so many varieties, but always is going to do what when you put acid on it? Fizz, right? That's because it's made up of calcite cement. Chert is a silica. It's basically quartz. So what would the hardness be for chert? What would you be able to do with it? Yeah, it'd be up by 7, right? It'd be around 7 because you'd be able to scratch glass with it. It's some hard stuff. So if you're ever not sure, see if it fizzes, and then see if you can scratch glass with it. Now, remember, chert around here forms inside of pockets in limestone. So it's not uncommon to find a piece of chert with a hunk of limestone still around the outside of it. Totally find that. Same thing with a geode. You can find a geode with a piece of limestone still attached to the other side of it, where it just hasn't worn away yet, because those both weathered out of the limestone. OK, sedimentary rocks. This is the answer to the next question. As they form, where they form, uh, what they are, tells us a lot about where they form. So looking at a near shore environment, let's say a beach. The stuff on the beach, as you know, is sand. So there's an environment where sandstone will, will likely deposit it and form. As you go further out from the beach, the, if the ocean is calm enough, the really fine particles start to get deposited, the little silts that are really, really fine stuff, the silts and the clays get put down. And so you'll end up with shales, those flat layered rocks that we looked at. If you go out just a little bit farther, but still considered near shore, so we're not talking deep ocean here, shallow, has to be very calm. The water itself that contains lots of calcium in it, it will, it will crystallize out of the water. It will precipitate, and it will settle to the bottom. Like There has to be a lot of it in there. That's what the shells make their bodies out of. Like Creatures that have shells, they take calcium out of the water and build their shells. And then when they die, they sink down or stay down in the limestone. So our limestone has so many crinoids and brachiopods and all kinds of stuff in it, because this is like out by where the reef would be. Okay. And this is even more inshore. Has anybody been on a reef, like in Florida? No? Like a lot of them are a, a good distance out from shore, but they're still shallow, right? They're still not super deep. Some down. You guys should go to a reef sometime. They're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful places. Okay. Everybody got it? No one answered there? OK, pop over to the next question. Oh, well, we're on the topic. Does anybody know where the sand on the beach comes from? Where does it come from? The what? Volcanoes? Fish poop, yeah, fish poop, no. <laughs> the sand on the beach actually comes from the breaking down of rocks way, way inland. So think about granite that we've looked at. All those little bits and pieces in there, John, you, met, you identified correctly that it had quartz in there. The little tiny quartz pieces are the hardest parts inside that rock. And so when everything else wears away and completely dissolves and is destroyed, the little quartz pieces, the tiny little crystals, keep bouncing their way along down the creek to the river, out to another river, out to a bigger river, eventually to get dumped into a gulf someplace at the mouth of the river where all the sand goes free and ends up in the ocean. So it all starts on land, like in a mountain range, with little bits of granite and things like that that have quartz in them. Because most of the sand is tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces of quartz. If you look at it under a microscope, it's beautiful. It's really, it looks like all these little crystals. Now, how do the oceans get salty? Ooh. The salt comes from the same place. Turns out, when you break down things like feldspar, it completely weathers away and dissolves into salts. You get things like sodium and think calcium and stuff like that, and that washes its way all the way out. Yeah, John? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it's happening fast enough that we're going to notice a huge salinity change. 
But that's a fantastic question because you've got to wonder, if stuff is constantly washing in from the land, wouldn't it get saltier? And it would if it wasn't for the rock cycle. So check this out. In the oceanic ridges, in the middle of the oceans, new rocks being formed, and then it pushes outwards, right? And so out at the edges of those plate boundaries, those plates are subducting and getting pushed down and remelted into the mantle, right? They're getting pushed down. So the Earth's not getting bigger. The plates are just getting subducted. Well, as all those little creatures in the ocean make their bodies and the things precipitate and settle down to the bottom, it takes salt out of the water and puts it into the rock. And then the rock gets pushed back down underground and melted and then burps back out of a volcano on land and the whole salt process starts all over again. But as far as salinity goes, I suppose if enough glaciers melted fast enough, we would, it'd be real bad for ocean life. Like, you, like the salinity of the ocean's been stable for, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, the ocean salinity's been stable. Um, shoot, for at least as long as probably our atmosphere's been the same, I would say. Um, so yeah, a big change in ocean would be real bad. Yeah, John. Uh, the, well, I think that's a complicated question depending on where you're talking about. But we're, we're talking about uh, easily millions of years for some of it, I would say. Um, but glaciers move, so like new stuff gets put down and, and old stuff gets pushed and squished out. So they, they kind of move as they, as they sit there. Um, but it's been a real long time. But our Earth has changed a lot. Like we have had periods where there were no glaciers. And we've had periods where there was complete and total glaciation that we're going to talk about. There were a couple episodes known as snowball earth episodes where we think there's evidence in the rocks that the entire globe froze all the way over. Like there was no part that was not frozen, which is hard to even imagine, right? I mean, humans weren't here, obviously, so we don't have any, any knowledge of that. But the earth environment has changed a lot. What we do know is when those fluctuations have happened, with, especially with climate, there have been major mass extinctions. Just about every mass extinction in the fossil record has some form of a climate event associated with it. Whether it's the rock that wiped out the dinosaurs, that changed our climate. It blocked out the sun. Like producers died. That was a, that was a climate event. Like all, almost every mass extinction has been a climate event in some way, form, or another, um, even if we can't directly pin it on there. So yeah, it's something to definitely be concerned of. And with how fast that stuff's melting, I mean, we, we could maybe, maybe not in your lifetime, but maybe we're talking your kids or your grandkids, they, they very well might see Florida go underwater, depending on how much melts and where it melts. Because ice that melts on land makes the water level go up a lot more than ice that melts in water. So it depends on where the glacier's at. If it's out in the water and it melts, the water level doesn't change much, just like ice melting in your glass. Your water doesn't spill out when the ice melts. It stays the same level because it's, it's displacing about as much as it's floating up out of. But if it's on land, that's all new water, and it goes up, right? And then our temperatures change, which is also scary. But let's, uh, let's wrap this guy up here. So the sedimentary structures, there are some structures that we'll look at. Um, one is ripples, and these ripple marks uh, form, and they can actually show us the direction that the water moved. Here's some modern day ripples. So you can see those are like just right off of the beach. That's in the water right there. Um, in a lake in upstate New York, I think I took that picture. And then this is rock with ripples in it. So when we see the ripples, we know this is an environment where ripples naturally form. Okay. We can look at things called cross bedding. And this is a picture from the cave I take students in over here on the right. And you can see these little lines going like this through the middle. And then there's some on the bottom underneath of it and some above it that are flat. And the, the ones in the middle are going at an angle. That's cross bedding. So this happens when you've got sediment that's getting deposited and it kind of gets pushed up a gentle slope and slides down the other side and it piles up. And you can think of it in terms of either a ripple or even something as big as a sand dune. Has anybody been up to the Indiana, Indiana dunes, Michigan dunes? Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? Like, you go up there and you can get running and just jump, launch yourself off of those things. It's so cool. But if you walk up it, like if you're at Tower Hill, it's this long, gradual hike uphill. Like, it's a long time to get up to the top. 
But once you're on top, if you look down over the backside that's somewhat wooded, it's very steep. That's called the slip face. So what happens is sand grains bounce, they saltate. The wind blows across the lake, this big fetch of open area, and these little sand grains go bouncy, 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 and they pile themselves up this slope. And so it's this long, gentle slope going up. But on the backside, where they bounce up to the top, they just slip right down. And so it's steep on the other side. And you get the same thing uh, in a rock. So you can actually see like where the sand grains bounce their way up and where they slid down. So you can say whether this is water or whether this is wind, it was blowing or moving in that direction. And we, we know precisely not only like where the rock formed, but which direction the wind was blowing which is wild, right? Just from a rock. Uh, this is another example of reading those cross beds. So you can see here the bouncing, which way it went, where the slip face is, and those are those cross beds. Okay. This is just cutting away an actual sand dune. Like you can see it in the sand before it's ever turned to rock. Okay. Uh, if you get even slopes, you've got waves going both ways. So this is pretty common on a beach. It goes in, it goes out, and you get even slope. So next time you're on a beach, go out there and take a look. Do you see ripples that point one way, or do they, are they nice and symmetrical looking? Right? So you'll see that whether you're in a, a river, uh, we can go down to the creek. When you're down to the creek, take a look at them, and you'll see the cross bedding. If you cut into it, you'll see, actually see it. Sand dunes are similar. Um, if you go out to Utah, loads of loads and loads of that stuff out there in Moab and all that is all rock sand dunes. It's ancient sand dunes that have turned to rock. All right, so. Yeah, we did some more of these. Talked about those some. There we go, turbidity currents. So another type of rock that we'll see that's a sedimentary structure. And I have had students find one of these before in the creek. It's pretty rare. They're graded. So if you find a rock that's got a bunch of little pebbles in it, and right up above that are a bunch of even finer pebbles, and above that is even finer sand, and maybe above that is some fine silt, what happened here uh, was typically out in, the, out in the ocean, there's a steep, if there's a steep area offshore and an avalanche occurs and this, all this material slides down the slope, it stirs it up, it becomes very turbid and turbulent. All of the heavy stuff sinks to the bottom quick. And then the lighter stuff on top of that. And then the lighter stuff on top of that. And then the lightest most stuff, the silts and the clays just settle on top of that. And you get this perfectly layered thing. When that turns to rock, if you get a piece of it like this, you see like big pebbles, littler pebbles, littler, littler, all the way up to the finest stuff. And that's known as a turbidite. Turbidite. Mud cracks. That's me on some mud cracks. That cracks. That's actually in, um, um, in Death Valley, which just broke all the records, right? Just broke records for having the hottest temperature ever. Oh, I can't remember what it was. It was... It, if you look it up, it was, it was stupid hot. I have been here and it feels like you are on the moon. It's the most I've ever, in my, I've been a lot of places in my life, but this is the only place I've ever been where I felt like if my supply, if my little oxygen bag of water on the back of my back runs out, I'm just gonna die. Like, 134. Didn't feel that bad? Wow, it was hot while I was there. Yeah, we had, we had some, some sodas in the back of our truck while we were driving. And, and were you out on the gravel, out on the dirt roads and everything? So you're in like the main part of the park. Like we went out into the, into the really hot like back country parts. Um, you need a four wheel drive to go back there at all. Like, like fully, like people drive back there and, and, and die. That's why they call it Death Valley because you get stranded back there. Um, but you, it felt like being out on the moon and all those sodas exploded in the back of the truck just from the bouncing in the heat, like just exploded glass bottle like like everywhere <laughs> so um yeah it, it was intense in fact i've got videos of myself spitting water onto the surface of these mud cracks and you just hear it just goes and it's gone instantly just disappears like it absorbed evaporated just gone um, but this stuff can eventually become rocks um and you see mud cracks we've i've one time in my life i found one rock from the creek that had full-on mud cracks in it. You could see the cracks like where it used to be a mud plain and it hardened into rock. So those are possible to find out in the creek. They're worth a lot of points. They're hard to find. Good luck. <laughs> these are a little bit easier to find and we found some of these the other day. I had a, one student found one. Uh, glacial striations. 
So these lines happen because a glacier picked up a, a rock or drug itself over a rock and ground grooves and they're, they're unidirectional. They go, all go one way. So see every mark on here is going the same direction. You can see where it was embedded. I've got two up here. I'll leave them up here. You can take a look. So these are something you might look for. You'll notice if you look close, this, the side that's been striated uh, has been abraded and almost polished, like it's almost smooth from the glacier riding it. Uh, almost always when I find these, it's dolomitic limestone. I don't know exactly where it came from, most likely Canada or someplace in northern Indiana, but they're always the same type of rock usually when I find them down here. But it could be any type of rock, right, that gets ground like that. So those are glacial striations, okay? But you get the question answered there for number seven from the last one. Okay, that's it. Make sure you've got your quiz submitted. Next up, we're going to look at some fossils.